Hey everyone, in this video I want to provide a quick introduction to vector databases. Um, you know, it's one of the new hottest terms in AI tech and especially with the rise of lang large language models. So I thought I'd give a little bit of an introduction to what they are and we'll also go through a code example in Python later in the video so we can actually see how to use these vector databases and see how they work. So let's get right into it. So to understand vector databases, we actually first have to understand vectors. Now, what are vectors? Vectors are just lists of numbers. That's all they are. And there are a special type of vector called an embedding. Now, embeddings are vectors that have rich, machine-understandable information baked into them. So we can take data such as images, text, and audio and convert them into embeddings. So here we are, we're taking an image of a dog and we're converting that into a, an embedding, which is just a list of numbers. We're taking the sentence, I love pizza, and converting that into an embedding. And we're also taking an audio file and converting that into an embedding. So no matter what data we have as input, we can convert them to embeddings. Now, how do we convert um, this data to embeddings? Well, these embeddings are learned by our model. So while we don't actually understand these numbers, baked into these embeddings are the features of the original content, which the models can't understand. So embeddings are kind of like the five senses for machines. It's kind of like an internal representation that only machines understand. It's, you can think of it as a portal through which they can comprehend the real world in a language that it understands, which is numbers. So we can take this data, which a computer doesn't inherently understand what the sentence, I love pizza means, or it doesn't understand what this picture is. But when we convert it to embeddings, it gives it more semantic information and understanding about what this um, data actually means. Because to the ML model, this is perfectly understandable. Now, one of the reasons embeddings are powerful is because they're able to capture the meaning and cool information and core information of unstructured data in a way that machines can easily understand. And one of the cool properties of embeddings is that they preserve the similarity between the original content. So two embeddings of two Labrador images will be similar, but the embedding of a Labrador and the embedding of a hammer will be wildly different. So in this diagram here, we have a 2D plot, and you can think of this plot as the embedding space. Now we have the dots in blue, which represent the embed embeddings for images of dogs. And you can see that they are physically closer to each other. And the green dots are images of cats, and you can see that they are also physically closer to each other. And we have the red dot, which is an image of a hammer. And you can see that different semantic classes are separated from each other. So dogs are in their own area, cats in their own area, hammers in their own area, and every semantic class will be in its own kind of domain. And that's the cool property about embeddings, is that they preserve this similarity between images or content, or any content in general. Now, there are many ways of measuring the similarity or closeness of embeddings, and these include cosine distance, dot product, and Euclidean distance. The smaller the distance between two embeddings, the more similar they are. Embeddings are the reason convolutional neural networks are able to understand visual content, and LLMs are able to understand natural language. Now, a question arises. How do we store these embeddings? Well, embeddings are not your typical kind of data. They're not like images or text, and they're not like tabular data. So we need a new kind of strategy to store these embeddings. And when thinking of a storage solution for embeddings, our main priority is fast retrieval and fast similarity search. And we'll talk about more, we'll talk more about the use cases later. But our storage solution should be able to handle high dimensional data and should facilitate fast retrieval of these embeddings. Well, there exists relational databases, right? Why don't we use those? They have fast retrieval through indexes. But the problem is that these indexes rely on human understandable features, which embeddings lack. 
So you have a relational database, right? And let's say you want to query the table by year. So you would create an index on that year. So then what would happen is the lookup time for that particular um, query would be constant time. But that feature, the year feature, that's human understandable. And we can sort by that feature. But embeddings lack human understandable features. So if we go up to the previous example, and let's say we want to sort, we want to index on this first, um, this first uh, column right here. What does that mean? Because we don't understand what these features actually mean, then there's no point in indexing on a particular column. So relational databases are out of the question. Well, what about document databases or graph databases? While these databases have their own advantages and use cases, they're not built for embeddings. So we need a solution that's built for embeddings. Vector databases. A vector database is a structure specifically built to store embeddings. You can think of a vector database as a pool of embeddings. So let's say we have a data set of a million images. We pass each image through a trained embedding model and we get a million embeddings for each image. Sorry, we get one embedding for each image. So we get a million embeddings. And then we just store those in a vector database. Now, vector databases facilitate fast retrieval and similarity search. So let's say I have this query constant, which is an image of a Labrador. I pass it through an embedding model and I get the query embedding. Now I use that to query the vector database so I can find similar vectors. And then the vector database will give me all the vectors that match that query embedding. So I can, you can see here that it provided me with more Labrador images. But how exactly do vector databases find similar embeddings? We talked about similarity metrics such as cosine distance, dot product, and Euclidean distance. For a database with a few embeddings, we can calculate the cosine distances between the query vector and all the embeddings in the database and return the ones with the lowest distances. But for a vector database with millions of embeddings, with each embedding having hundreds or thousands of dimensions, doing a linear search through all these embeddings is simply intractable. For this reason, there are several algorithms that enable vector databases to perform quick retrieval and similarity search. Now, this is an ongoing area of research as more efficient algorithms are constantly being proposed. Most, most vector databases use a combination of these algorithms to enable ultra-fast retrieval. However, these algorithms often follow an accuracy speed trade-off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through one of these algorithms, which is locality-sensitive hashing. So we'll just get a better idea of how these vector databases work internally. Now, what LSH does is it sorts the embeddings into buckets using a hashing function where each bucket contains similar vectors. And you can think of each bucket containing vectors for dogs, uh, one bucket containing vectors for dogs, one bucket containing vectors for cats, etc. So these buckets are like groupings of semantically similar embeddings. So we have our vectors here, we pass them through the hashing function and they get grouped into um, buckets. Now, when a new query comes in, the hashing function maps the query vector to one of the buckets. So if the query vector was for a dog, the hashing function would, would route the query vector to the dog bucket. Once the bucket is found, then a linear search can be performed to find the candidates which are most similar to the query. So in this case, we're not doing a linear search over the entire search space. We're first limiting our search space to a single bucket. And then what we're doing is we're just doing a linear search through that bucket. Now, the reason this works is because the hashing function is designed to group similar vectors into the same bucket. This method is much faster than searching the entire database, as there are far fewer vectors in each bucket than in the entire database. However, LSH is an approximate search because it doesn't look at all the vectors, so it might overlook candidates in other buckets. So there we have that accuracy speed trade-off. Okay. Let's just take a breath and analyze what we've learned so far. An embedding is a way to numerically represent data, such as images, audio, and text, in a way that machines can understand and interpret. 
A vector database is a pool of embeddings which allows for quick retrieval and similarity search through the use of special algorithms. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to go through a code example so we can actually see how to use vector databases. One of the most popular open source vector databases is Chroma DB, and that's what we're going to be using in this um, demonstration. So I have a Colab notebook ready and ready to go. So let's just see how this vector database works. So we need to install Chroma DB, so I'll go ahead and install that. Okay, now that Chroma DB has been installed, let's see how this works. So the first step is to create a client, and this client is just going to manage all of our collections. Next, let's create a collection. So a collection is basically a vector database in Chroma DB's terms. So it's just a new instance of a vector database. And I'm going to call this collection example. Now let's add some documents to our database. And what Chroma DB will automatically do is it's going to automatically transform these documents into embeddings. So I have three documents here, and it's just simple text. So pizza is good, pizza is bad, and leaves are green. And I have given them corresponding IDs. So what Chrome is going to do is it's going to take this um, string, pass it through an embedding model, and it's going to generate an embedding for us. And that could be some high dimensional vector. Now let's query our collection. So the query text we're going to use is pizza is amazing. And what Chrome is going to do is it's going to take this piece of text, convert it to an embedding through the embedding model, and then it's going to search through the um, to the vector database using its algorithms and it will return the most similar results. So using pizza is amazing and with these documents, let's see what results we get. Okay, so that right there is Chroma downloading the um, embedding model. All right, looks like we got a result. Um, okay, so we, we returned three results and we got these distances and these documents. Okay, so our query text was pizza is amazing. So we would expect that pizza is good to be the best match, right? And that is the case here. So pizza is good, got the lowest score, which means that it's the most similar to our query text. Um, then pizza is bad, got a slightly worse score. So it's a little bit more different. And then leaves are green, got a completely different score. Um, completely high score because it's not even related to pizza is amazing. So I hope you can kind of see why this would be useful because we can take this unstructured data such as text and we can perform queries on it and we can find similar content by leveraging the power of embeddings. All right, let's go through a second example. Uh, in this example, I have some more um, documents and I have pizza was originally made in Italy pizza is tasty and leaves are green. And what's different in this example is I've also added some metadata. So for the first example, for the first document, I've added metadata, which tells it that the source is from Wikipedia. The second document is from a blog and the third document is also from Wikipedia. So to query the collection, we'll just, um, this, this will be our query text. So we'll query for pizza facts and the source will be from Wiki. So this query is only going to return documents which have the source as Wikipedia. So we would expect this document and this document to be returned. Um, we wouldn't expect pizza is tasty to be returned because it's from a blog. So let's just run that. And there we go. We only get the documents which are from Wikipedia. And the document pizza was originally made in Italy that has a that, that got the best score because obviously it, it is a pizza fact and that is relevant to the query but leaves are green didn't get a good score because um it's not related to the query so that was a quick code demo in python using chroma db uh, chroma, chroma db is a fantastic open source database library and um yeah so you can just walk through this if you would like to get um a better understanding of how to use vector databases um, let's talk a bit more about the popular vector databases that are available currently. 
So Chroma isn't the only vector database. In fact, a huge number of vector databases have popped up recently with the rise of LLMs. And even some non-vector databases have even added support for um, vector search. So here's a diagram that just shows some of the vector databases that are available. And you can see there are also some like PostgreSQL is a relational database, but is, it has also added support for vector search. So just take a look at that diagram to understand what kind of vector databases are available for use. Like I said, um, Chroma DB is a great, fantastic open source vector database. So if you want to start, you know, tinkering with vector databases, just start with Chroma DB and you can probably explore more after that. But I think Chroma DB is fantastic for, you know, getting a vector database up and running quickly. All right. So I mentioned earlier that I would talk about some of the use cases of um, vector databases. So vector databases have become increasingly popular with the rise of large language models. So for long-term memory of large language models, there's something called retrieval augmented generation. And this is basically enabling a large language model to be grounded in some ground truth, basically. So we can have a collection of corporate documents, which we want our chatbot to reference. So we want our chatbot to reference these corporate documents, corporate documents, so it is accurate according to those documents. We can convert those documents and pop them into a vector database. And using retrieval augmented generation, we can then uh, give this information to the large language model. So that will aid it in its um, prompt uh, in the text that it generates. So it's kind of like a long-term memory for large language models. Now, vector databases also are used in search engines. So Google transforms your query into an embedding and then performs a similarity search over its indexed web. So again, that's another key application for vector databases. And also for recommendation engines, finding similar content in a vector database based on what you've already purchased and watched could be used by companies like Netflix, Amazon, and Spotify. I hope I was able to give you a rough idea about how vector databases work, a little bit of how their internals work, and I hope the code example really showed you the power of these vector databases. Now, there are these awesome blogs which I found um, which go way deeper into how the internals of vector databases work, and I would highly recommend giving these a read if you're interested in learning more about vector databases. Um, also, definitely go play around with some vector databases packages such as Chroma DB and Milvis. And most of these packages are open source, which means you can directly inspect the code behind these libraries as well. And with that, that concludes this video. I hope you found it valuable. And if you did, smash that like button and subscribe to be updated on my future uploads. Uh, with that, I'll end it here and I will see you in the next video. Peace.